Well, welcome. Uh, the first snow of the year. It's amazing to me how it impacts <laughs> so many different things <laughs> when it snows a little bit outside, but I'm grateful for the moisture. And please remember, continue every day, every throughout the day to pray for the folks in California. They could use some of this moisture. And it's just a reminder to us that God, God provides, God takes care of us, but there are times things happen we don't understand. Things that are so devastating and so so difficult to deal with. So I, I just want to take a moment or two and just pray again. Not just for California, but pray for our country and pray for God's hand to be on us. And so before I pray to, to lead us, I would invite anyone that this is heavy on your heart and mind to stand right where you are and lead us out in prayer as well. So let's pray together. And as you feel prompted, you go ahead and pray as well. Lord, we pray specifically for the firefighters in California. Uh, they're not just from California, but they come across, to, from across the U.S. Give them safety in their travels. Uh, protect their families as they're away. And Lord, we uh, pray for those that have uh, experienced so much devastation. Mm. We pray that you would provide the comfort only that you can. Amen. Thank you that you are the God of hope and that you fill us with your joy and your peace as we trust in you so that we may overflow with hope. Thank you that hope and peace and joy are not something we create, but there's something that you create in us as we trust in you. Father, I pray that during the difficult times that are happening all around our country, not just fires on the West Coast, but shootings around the country. Political issues that are turning into just violent clashes. All kinds of unrest. Father, may your people not be afraid, but turn to you. May we look to you to meet our needs. May we look to you who gives us the very breath in our bodies to be our source of hope, to be the one that we turn to for strength, for encouragement, for joy. I'm grateful that joy is not based on our circumstances, but it's based on knowing you and trusting you. Father, we come together today, this first snow of the, of the season, because we wanted to, to meet together and we wanted to hear from you. Father, we, we pray that as we look into your word together, you would speak to each and every one of us in the area that you need for us to hear your voice. May we listen well, and more than just hear, may we do something with what you put in us 
today. In Jesus' name, amen. So did anybody growing up have action figures that you really liked? Okay, ladies, anybody have a Barbie? Anybody have a Barbie? That's an action figure. They move them into play. Now, uh, and probably that's not really true. You didn't have a Barbie because if you had one, you probably had three. I mean, Barbie was really popular. For me, for me, I like G.I. Joe. There we go. My dad was in the Air Force, not, not Army like G.I. Joe. But I loved, I had the little Army guys. I had all that stuff. But the guy I really, really liked was Big Jim. Big Jim was, was the guy that they made. He had a body kind of like G.I. Joe's, but his arms were rubber, and they were posable. And every time his arm would go up, his bicep would flex. And I thought, man, that's the guy I want to be. Now, my friends, G.L. and Todd Cullum, they had Big Jim's as well. They had something I didn't have. Their mom was a seamstress for Nordstrom. Mrs. Cullum made us capes for our big gyms. And we were the coolest. They were the bomb. We loved big gym. Now, today, there's all kinds of action figures out there. There's, you know, if, if you go, if you've seen any of the Avenger movies, any of the Marvel stuff, you see that there's uh, action figures all over the place. Well, here's an action figure that I think we can all probably relate to <laughs> Mr. Incredible. Now, we like Mr. Incredible because Mr. Incredible is a normal guy. When we first meet him in the very first movie, he's working a, a regular job. He's this massive hulk of a person in this little itty-bitty cubicle. And, he, and he's, he's trying his very best just to be a normal person. But the thing about superheroes is they can't be normal people. They just, it just doesn't work for them. They don't do normal very well. I was walking through the mall yesterday, and I've been thinking about this for quite a while. And I, I thought, you know, wouldn't it be cool if there were a Jesus action figure? Now, I, I made some calls, and I looked online, and there are little characters you can get that look like Jesus that you can keep in your pocket and things. But uh, that wasn't, didn't do for me. I, I went to the Lego store, and I put together a pocket Jesus. Now, now, the cool thing about this little pocket Jesus is I can put him in my pocket, take him with me. I'm going through life. I'm, oh, something comes up. Oh, pop out Jesus. We'll take care of the problem. Something I, I want to do that I'm not necessarily thinking Jesus is going to like, well, put him away. <laughs> I got this pocket Jesus. Now, please, I, I really don't mean to be offensive but I think that we often treat Jesus like a pocket Jesus. The demands that he makes on our lives are way more than get up five minutes before the service starts and get over there. They're way more than, you know, maybe I ought to dust that Bible off a little bit and open it up. Jesus, as Mark has been describing him in his gospel, has demands on all of our lives, on everything about our lives. And yet, if we're honest, there are times that someone like this is more important to us than the real Jesus. And Jesus just becomes the pocket Jesus. Now, if that is our attitude about Jesus, then we are going to be super uncomfortable with how the book of Mark comes to an end. This week and next week are the last two sermons in our study through the gospel of Mark. On the 25th, we're going to do a summary, and there's some things in your worship folder as well as if you... Uh, subscribe to our Friday Blast, where I want to give you an opportunity to share with us the lessons you've learned through the study of Mark. But as we come down to the end of this study, this is going to make us a little bit uncomfortable because 
what Jesus says to us today, what he says to us in Mark chapter 15, the first 39 verses, is incredible. Not Mr. Incredible, but truly incredible because of what he asks of us. Because Jesus is the only true superhero who really did come to save the day. But he doesn't fit the mold of an action figure. He won't be manipulated. He won't do what we want him to do. He will not dance to our tune. He is God in the flesh. And knowing that he's God, it means that he calls the shots. He's in charge. He's the one who says what should happen and what shouldn't happen. Now that's hard for us. Because we want to be in control. We want to be in charge. So I want to challenge us today to think not American dream, to think not that I'm in charge of my destiny, but what would it look like if I really made Jesus who he already is, Lord? If I, if I behaved as though he were in charge, as though he were in control of my life, Turning to Bibles to Mark chapter 15. We're going to start in the first verse. If, if you don't happen to have a Bible of your own, there's a Bible in the pew in front of you. We would love for you to take that home as your gift from us. Last week we saw that Jesus was wrongfully accused. He was wrongfully condemned of a, a trumped up charge of blasphemy. You see, blasphemy doesn't fit for Jesus because blasphemy means that you're claiming to be God. And guess what? If you're God... It's not blasphemy. So Jesus has been convicted of a trumped up charge because that is exactly what the, the, the Pharisees wanted to do. They wanted to find some way to accuse him. The problem was, end of chapter 14, they accused Jesus of blasphemy. But they wanted Jesus to pay the ultimate price. We saw last week in, in, from Leviticus 24 that if you are uh, guilty of blasphemy, you could be stoned. You could be killed that way by, by the Jewish people. But they didn't want that. They wanted Jesus to suffer the ultimate humiliation, degradation. So they turned him over to Pilate. And he goes through this civil trial again under trumped up charges because not, no longer are they going to try to have him tried by Pilate for blasphemy because Pilate wouldn't care about that. Pilate would just say to them, look, that's your laws. I don't care about that. You go and do with them what you want. Matter of fact, that's exactly what he says to him in the Gospel of John. But in Mark, Mark doesn't give us that little detail. Instead, what Mark says to us is that Pilate... Pilate has something else that he's worried about. Pilate is worried because the people of Israel say to him that Jesus claims to be a king. And if you claim to be a king, you are a threat to the nation of Rome. And you're a threat to Caesar. And that was very sobering for Pilate. And so Pilate challenges them challenges Jesus, excuse me, uh, on that, or quizzes Jesus on that charge. Look at verse one. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes, the whole council. They bound Jesus, they led him away, delivered him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, you've said so. Now, imagine it was a little frustrating for Pilate. He asked him a simple question, are you the king of the Jews? And he doesn't say yes. Not in so many words anyway. He says, that's what you say. Jesus, in one of the other gospels, they have a, a little bit more of a conversation where Jesus describes to him that, yes, I'm a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would be fighting. My kingdom is, is, is a different kingdom, one you can't even relate to, Pilate. But Pilate 
still is concerned about this particular issue because history tells us a little bit about Pilate that if you didn't know, you would miss out on, on what this is, why this is really so important. Because see, the, the Jews did not want Jesus to wriggle out of their clutches now that they had him. And so they would do anything they had to to make sure that Jesus suffered crucifixion, the humiliation, the degradation of that. So in charging Jesus with treason, the religious leaders were actually playing their trump card. History tells us why. At this time in Pilate's life, he had fallen into disfavor with Tiberius Caesar. Pilate had been appointed by, uh, to be prefect of Judea by a man named Lucius Aelius Sejanus. Sejanus hated the Jewish people. And it was, it was his heart's desire to exterminate them, to wipe them out. Well, as, Pilate, as uh, Sejanus' man, Pilate, it looks like, tried to carry out Sejanus' desires and will. The three, simple th three things that we know of that Pilate did to the Jewish people, the first thing he did was he installed Roman shields throughout the city of Jerusalem with some sort of slogan or maybe even an icon that, that referred to Caesar's deity, Caesar being a god. Well, we don't have a picture of what those were. We have pictures of, of what their shields were and, 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 and on one, one part of them would say, you know, talk about the divineness of the Caesar. We figure it must have been one of those shields. So he spread them throughout the city of Jerusalem and it caused the Jews to come into a huge uproar. They went to him and they told him, you gotta take these things down. And he said, I've done what I've done. I'm not gonna take them down. So they sent a delegation to Tiberius. Now, Tiberius at the time was trying to be retired. He didn't so much care for them doing that. A second thing that he did was he wanted to build an aqueduct in Jerusalem. So he seized funds from, from the, uh, uh, the treasury of the temple to build his aqueduct. Again, another delegation, another trip to see Tiberius. The third thing he did was, uh, this is referred to in Luke chapter 13, there were a group of, of Jewish worshipers who were at the temple. They all came from the area of Galilee and Pilate killed them. It says it, he, he mixed their blood with the blood of their sacrifices. We don't know exactly what that looked like, but we know it was something that really caused a lot of, of heartburn and heartache for the nation of Israel. Sejanus, so when some of these things took place, would, would kind of stand in the gap for Pilate. The problem for Pilate was that Sejanus had been executed. And so Tiberius had had enough. Tiberius Caesar said, you know what? Uh, one more thing, Pilate, and your history. Now Pilate knew that, and the people of the day knew that as well. So the chief priests laid down their ace. You see, what was happening was Pilate had, had examined Jesus, and he saw that it, there was nothing worthy of having him executed. He realized that the chief priest wanted to get rid of Jesus because he was envious. They were envious of the success he'd had. And so he thought, you know, why would I execute a, an innocent man? And he, and he pushed a little bit and he said, why don't, I just, why don't I just flog him and we'll let him go. He'll learn his lesson. And here's what they said. This comes out of the Gospel of John, verse, chapter 19. If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. They knew it. And Pilate understood what they were saying to him. I imagine Pilate stood there, the blood drained from his face, and he, he knew it. He was caught in their chains. It was Pilate or Jesus. So the next verse in chapter 19 of John. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out, sat down in the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Arabic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It's about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, behold your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, now listen carefully to this. 
we have no king but Caesar. They were willing to completely turn their back on God, who they had always claimed to be their king, and say that Caesar was their king so that they could deliver Jesus over to be crucified. Jesus' crucifixion was the end game. But have you ever wondered why Mark spent so much time on Jesus' suffering? I don't know if you read through this 15th chapter of Mark, but he spends a lot of time talking about the abuse that Jesus takes, talking about the way they beat him, the way, the way they abused him and hurt him, and how he suffered. The soldiers get into the act. This is between verses 16 and 20. It says they clothed him in a purple cloak. They, they twisted together a crown of thorns. They jammed it on his head. They, they mocked him by saluting him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They were beating him in his head with a reed. They spit on him. They knelt in front of him, again mocking him, doing homage before him, calling him the King of the Jews. The soldiers got into the act. Even those who passed by the cross and the religious leaders, look over in verse 29. They got into the act. They said, it says, those who passed by derided him. That word deride is blaspheme. To me, it seems like a really strange twist of irony. The very thing that the Jews convict, convicted Jesus of, blasphemy, is the very thing that these who went by did to Jesus. They blasphemed him. They derided him. Now, the religious leaders, they continued on and they said, he saved others, he can't save himself. Even the guys who were crucified on him as his partners in crucifixion on either side of him, the last verse of that section in verse 32, it says, those who were crucified with him also reviled him. From verse 16 down to verse 32, there's 17 verses that focus on Jesus' suffering. And in verse 24, can somebody tell me what are the three words that are used to refer to Jesus' crucifixion? What are they? No, verse 24. It says, and they crucified him. And they crucified him. That's it. That's all it says. Three words. 17 verses focused on his suffering in three words to refer to his crucifixion. Why do you think that is? I couldn't get past it as I was studying this passage. It seems to me that Jesus is wanting us to understand something very important. We focus on Jesus' death on our behalf, and we should. He's the only one that can atone for our sins. He's the only one that can, that can forgive us and make us a son or, or daughter of God. He's the only one. But Mark's point isn't just to have us focus on his sacrifice for us. His point is to have us focus on his suffering. Why do you think that is? I think at least one good reason is that he wants us to understand what it means to follow him. That's what the Gospel of Mark is all about. What does it mean to follow after Jesus? To follow Jesus is to suffer. That is not a very popular message. It wasn't then, they didn't even get it, and it's not today. We would rather hear the message that if you follow Jesus, everything's going to be great. You'll have nice cars, nice homes, fat wallet. And sometimes God blesses that way. But that is not what it means to be a disciple. It means to, to be a disciple means we've got to be willing to be like Jesus. Not pocket Jesus. But the real Jesus. And willingly say, I will do whatever you want me to do. I will go wherever you want me to go. You can take from me. You can give to me anything you want to. And I will follow you. I will listen to you. This was part of Jesus' message from the very beginning. 
Matthew 5, 11, Jesus said, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. And then again in Matthew 10, you will be hated by, for, by all for my name's sake. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. Now that's not the rosy scripture meditation you probably started your day with. I'm a recovering people pleaser. I don't want people not to like me. But in order to be a disciple, he says, you will be hated by all men. That's hard stuff. Jesus was ridiculed and mockingly called King of the Jews four times by Pilate. The first two times happened in verse 2 and then in verse 9 where he's having this conversation with Jesus. Do you know who, you know, tell me who you are. Are you the king? And he uses this term king of the Jews. But then the third time that he says it, you can almost see the sneer on his face and hear the disdain in his voice when he says in verse 12, then what shall I do with this man you call the king of the Jews? He's talking to the Jewish leaders. He is, he's reveling, I think, in the irony that these men brought one of their own, a Jewish rabbi, to him to kill. What do you want me to do with your king? The fourth time, Pilate doesn't actually speak the words. He writes them on, on a placard, which was common practice, and they put them above the, the criminal that was being crucified so everybody would know the crime that they were accused and, and found guilty of. And he wrote the king of the Jews in three languages because this was a metropolitan city and he wanted everyone to read what happens when anyone claims to be a king. See, he's remembering that anyone who claims to be a king is not a friend of Caesar. And he wants the report back to Tiberius to be this is what happens this is what Pilate does when anybody says they are a king to rival Caesar as if Jesus wasn't abused and mocked enough the religious leaders join in now what's interesting to me of, in this is, is if you look back in John chapter 19 in John 19, when the, when the religious leaders see the sign, King of the Jews, they go to Pilate and they say, don't, don't write King of the Jews, write, he claimed to be King of the Jews. And Pilate said to them, I wrote what I wrote. You're the ones who told me, if I'm not stern with this guy, Caesar's going to hear about it. So they didn't want him to actually say that, but it's, it's, it's ironic to me. When we begin in twisting around in sin in our lives and denying Jesus and, and allowing him to be pocket Jesus, we end up getting caught up in things we would never do as a follower of Christ. And the Jewish leaders would never have claimed Jesus as their king. But that's exactly what happens, verse 31 to 32. So also the chief priests and the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, he saved others, and he cannot save himself. Then listen to this. They don't say it like everybody else did. They didn't say it like Pilate. They didn't say it like the soldiers. They say, let the Christ. Christ means anointed one. It, it conjures up images of the king that God had promised would come and take David's place. Let the Christ, the king of Israel, come down from the cross. They admit he's the Christ. He's the king of Israel. They call him by the very title they should have recognized him in, but he did not, they did not understand it. They didn't recognize him that way. Now, this Jesus is indeed the anointed Christ, the king of Israel, but he's different from the king they expected. He is not a pocket Jesus. He's not an action figure. He is the suffering king. And the path to his glory lay through the cross. It's interesting to me that his own people, 
referringly mocking, mockingly, excuse me, referred to him as king of the Jews. The Roman centurion, however, the guy who is in charge of the group that, that crucified Jesus, that he's in charge of the group that flogged him, he's in charge of the group that caused him to carry his cross down the main streets, he's in charge of everything. He was with Jesus every step of the way. The Jews say, let the Christ, the king of the Jews, come down from the cross. They call him all the right things. And the Roman soldier is the only one who recognizes Jesus for who he is. Look at verse 39. When the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. Truly, this man was the son of God. One of the questions that has preoccupied me as I've looked at this passage is why? Why? Why would Jesus do it? Why would he allow himself to be falsely accused? Why would he allow himself to be convicted of trumped up charges, beaten by his own people, turned over to the political authorities on more trumped up charges? Why would he not defend himself? Why would he submit to such severe humiliation? Why did he submit to such severe beatings? Why did he allow them to rip the meat from his body, nail him to the cross where he hung naked, humiliated at the hands of his own people? Humiliated at the hands of his own creation? Why? Why did Jesus come as our suffering king? Why not the superhero that everybody was looking for? They would have been more comfortable with Mr. Incredible. Let that thought dangle for just a moment. Over the years, the Jewish people have been accused of being Christ killers. Pilate and the Romans have been vilified. And some have looked in the mirror and pointed the finger at themselves and all of us, all of humanity, and said, we are guilty of Jesus' death. It was for my sin and yours that he hung on the cross. And though there is a, a bit of truth to each of those, the responsibility for Jesus' death rests on completely different shoulders. It is not your fault. It is not my fault. It's not the Jews' fault. It's not Pilate's fault. Although we all have responsibility. Isaiah 53 and verse 10 tells us whose responsibility Jesus' death was. Yet, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Jesus' Father determined to crush his own son. Okay. So responsibility for Jesus' death rests on God the Father's shoulders. It lays at his feet. We know who is responsible, but why? Let's grab that thought that's been dangling for just a couple seconds. Jesus endured all of this for me and for you, for all of humanity, as the one and only truly pure, sinless, unblemished sacrifice. He alone could pay the price for your sin and mine. Back to Isaiah 53. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God the Father is responsible for the sacrifice, but we are the reason. The song we began with today, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin have, had left a crimson stain and he through his sacrifice on your behalf and mine, he washed it white as snow. Now let the 
subtle details of this situation twist around in your mind for a second. You've heard the name Barabbas many times maybe. Barabbas, Bar is son, and Abba is, somebody tell me what Abba means. Daddy, father. It's a term of endearment that a child would say to their daddy. His name is son of the father. Think about this. Barabbas is son of the father. Now, this son of the father was guilty of rebellion and probably murder. He was rightly sentenced to death. He should have been hanging on the cross with the two guys on the either side. There are some who think that the two guys on either side were part of the same insurrection that Barabbas was, was uh, found guilty of. So you got these two guys hanging here and Barabbas, he is guilty of the same things. But he is set free when the true son of the father is substituted for him. The rightly convicted, imprisoned son of the father was released and the, son of, the true son of the father was bound in his place. I am Barabbas. You are Barabbas. God created you so that you could know him. Jesus died so that you could know him and become a true daughter or son of the Father. But why did Mark emphasize Jesus' suffering? Why did he spend 17 verses on that? Because he wants us to understand that to follow Jesus means that we need to be like Jesus. And in being like Jesus, we also will suffer. Beloved, Peter says, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Why should we expect to suffer? What does our suffering accomplish the first thing is God reveals his glory in us just like he did in Jesus in John 17 Jesus prayed father glorify yourself in me he knew what was coming and as people looked at him especially focusing on that Roman centurion what did he see he probably didn't understand Son of God the way we do. I mean, he was, grew, grew up with a pantheon of deities. He might have had more the idea that this is, this is a son of the gods. This is somebody unique, somebody special. But he saw it. And when we go through suffering, God will walk with us through that time so that his glory can be revealed in us. There's a second purpose that he accomplishes when we suffer. 2 Corinthians 4 says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not struck down. But not destroyed, excuse me. Always carrying about in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for the sake of Jesus. We who live are always given over to death for Jesus' sake. So that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. We suffer and it reveals his glory. But it also reveals our true identity as God's sons and as God's daughters so that the life of Jesus, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, may be manifested in our bodies, so that our mortal bodies will reflect who we are. We're God's children. And as the, 
the centurion was drawn to God through the son as he watched him suffer. The third reason that the purpose God accomplishes in our suffering is that he will draw other people to himself through us so that they will see, see us as we go through difficult times and they will say truly there's something different about this person. What is it? And as they get to know us and they hear our reason, they hear our love for Jesus, they will understand that truly this is a son of God. This is a daughter of God. This passage, I don't think, is a call. I don't think this passage is a call to action. I think this is a call to Jesus, the real Jesus. Let's take pocket Jesus and get rid of him. He's not gonna help anybody. But what he's asking each and every one of us to do is to understand what it means to follow me. He's asking us to, to not do more for Jesus, to be, but to become more like Jesus. To see his example, to follow his example, to let him be in charge of our lives. He doesn't want us to mimic his actions. He doesn't expect that we're gonna do miracles like he did. He may give us the ability to do some miracles, but it doesn't have to follow what exactly everything he did. Matter of fact, he said in John 14, 12 that we will do more things than even he did. He doesn't want us to mimic his actions. He wants us to become like him. He wants us to be like Christ. And so the greatest honor for any student is to be like their teacher, as Jesus said in Luke 6. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. He wants us to shift our passions from more effort to more Jesus. Rather than doing more for Jesus, he wants us to be more like Jesus. Now I know this is the heavy part of this message. He's calling us to sacrifice and to follow after him in that way. I want to encourage you to come back next week because you're going to see why this is so important. And it's good news. Jesus, thank you so much for your love for us and thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the sacrifice you made for us. But thank you for the example you give us as you call us to do like you did and suffer. Not because you like hurting us or you want there to be pain and problem, but you, you want us to become more like you so that you can reveal yourself in us. And you want other people to come to know you as they recognize a son or a daughter of God who follows after you even when times get difficult. In Jesus' name, amen. So after God's word is preached, here we respond in worship in primarily two ways. First is through tithes and offering. And I was thinking as I was working through this, those who are a little more cynical might laugh to themselves like, yeah, <laughs> worshiping is giving you more money. But the funny thing is, is that as we give, whether it's of ourselves, our time, our effort, or our money, it points, to, it points us to God. It shapes our heart. It forces us to depend on trust in the provider. But it also is the action behind the talk and behind the heart that says, Lord, I'm about what you want to accomplish. I'm about furthering your kingdom in a world, whether it's here in Golden or to the ends of the earth. So if you're a guest, we are glad you're here. Please don't feel obligated to give. If you're independently wealthy and you want to give, we're not going to turn that down. But don't feel obligated. We're glad you're here. If this is your church home, pray about what you could give and then give joyfully and gener generously because as I'm learning, the more I'm part of this church, and I'm sure those of you who have been a part of this church for a long time, is God is faithful and he uses his people in incredible ways. Um, and the second way we respond is through singing. So after offering is o over, feel free to stand and continue to worship God. So let us pray. Uh, Father, we ask that 
you use this offering to change lives. Use it to change lives and make an eternal significance, Lord. Help this church be a church that furthers your kingdom, that does your good, that points to your glory, whether it's in this very neighborhood, whether it's over at the School of Mines, or whether it's sending missionaries across the world to preach the good news. May you use this offering today to do incredible things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.